So that sets one's up to run some interesting relationship stuff. As with all of my siblings, we all suffered the same thing. So they're a very busy mom, um, a little detached, um, mm-hmm. and, and so I understand. Um, and a very busy dad by the time. Yeah, so he'd be operating at seven in the mornings and consult until seven in the evenings. So he would come home for lunch, but we were, of course, never there. So there was, yeah, I was thinking that the next place that I went to would be the, the place that would be peaceful, and that just obviously carries on and on and on. Mm. But, yeah, at um, junior school, high school, played sport, a lot of sport, cricket and tennis, um, hockey, rugby, mm. all those things. Mm. Um, enjoyed tennis a lot, did the best at tennis. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I pressured me too much, and then I, I played squash just to to take the pressure off because you can't play the two together. Um, and funny enough, enjoyed that uh, quite a lot. And were you, you know, academically minded? Did you enjoy your studies and you know, have an idea of where you wanted to head? For me, I had my fluff. Yeah, I was anyone in this church has a PhD, so. <laughs> No idea at all. And, and finishing school, also not really having any purpose or anything, because you look, I was looking for that first primary purpose, which is the point of connection of the inner parent. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have that, you're going to keep looking for that. Um, so it was about choosing to go to university. Was We were all expected to go to university. It wasn't whether we'd go, it's what we would do there, mm-hmm. that we had some choice. But I wanted to be a vet because my dad was a vet. Um, Did you really want to be a vet? No. I'm allergic <laughs> to animals and I'm very squeamish with that kind of thing. So 
definitely would have been a mistake. He said to be an accountant, they make more money than bets. So I looked at the stats with him and he was right. So I went off and became an accountant. Did no idea what accountants do or did, but it was about pleasing dad and making some money. Yeah, it has been a very supportive, good profession in that space. I've never worked as an auditor, um, so I went off and qualified. 21, I was finished, qualified, registered, ready to go. Um, then I went off to the army, which was um, fortunate in a sense. I was supposed to come back as the tax partner and I was going to hire a plumbing in tax law mm. while I was in the army, but then we had a dispute around uh, how they would support me while I was in the army. And mm. then said, sorry, I came on. I just said, we'll see where we at later on. And of course, the army is a whole different world. And to change from university, uh, you, you were vets. That's, yeah. That's so from vets to you know, national service. To Pretoria. To Pretoria. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You cut out for being a soldier. Bro. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the training camp we were in was for the lawyers, the accountants, and the psychologists. So it was an interesting group of slightly older guys. Right. Um, so that was, in a way, quite nice at the end of those guys. But Mm. They needed us to be a particular role, and you had to be an officer to do that. Mm. So we were all forced onto officers' courts despite mm. massive protests, uh, yeah. particularly from me, yeah. um, but forced, literally. So after a year, I became a lieutenant and played this role. The colonel kept back three of us to help him administer the camp, mm. and that worked out quite well for me because he. We did a little bit of work, and most of the time we could do what we liked. So I worked pretty much full time for the second year, okay. and realised that auditing was not for me, and business was a better, a better fit. Right. Okay. Of course, eh? Back to you, Michelle. I mean, going through school, did you have a sense of what you wanted to do? Were you keen on your studies, or were you just yeah. having fun or making yeah. friends? Well, I I felt a calling to be a social worker, and mm. didn't know one, never met one. And it was just something that I had in my heart. So, and where do you think that came from? Only oh God. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I have a, a sense of, of wanting to help. Um, I suppose social justice is important, and you know, but I, I didn't really know how that knew how that fit with social work. But, mm. You know, as a after school, I actually didn't need to decide then because I went to Belgium on Rotary Exchange. Mm -hmm. It was in itself an amazing year, mm -hmm. uh, such a privilege. Um, but then at the end of that year, my mom had to apply to university for me because I'm still overseas, and mm -hmm. she refused to to register me for social work. So I um, started just doing social science, and um, but still a sense of. I wanted to do social work, so then I went and spoke to social work students and got a better idea and confirmed that that's definitely what I want to do. Basically, forced my mom. <laughs> and why did why did your mom just? Yeah, you know, she was afraid. I think of me uh, working in the townships. You know, that was okay. something she didn't want for me. Um, I could understand, but yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I wanted to follow mm -hmm. follow that deep sense of what I wanted to do. Oh. And so did you follow that through? Yeah, I did. I did. I mean, thanks to my parents that supported me, you know, through university. I, I must say I'm grateful to them. Well, I did actually apply for a student loan. Because I was studying social work, the, the bank wouldn't give me a student loan. Wow. They discriminated yeah. against me, and I actually I took it up with them because my brother applied at the same time, and he was studying something else. And um, they said to me, quite frankly, you know, social workers don't earn a lot, and so sure. we're not going to support you. And then, you know, I... Pushed and they said, Oh, well, looking at your marks, okay, cool, we'll support you. But then I found a loan through someone else. <laughs> well, I'm sure if Roy had been applying for a study loan doing accounting or visa, no we would have the same problem. No well, problem. <laughs> his uh, brother was doing accounts and he, yeah. he got the loan. Yeah. 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 So, okay. And so then did you go on and work as a social worker? Yeah, I did. Um, started off going to the UK um, I, because I, I quite frankly didn't really know what I wanted to do in social work and it is a very broad degree and it's, um, you know, so I had to find the next step, um, which I did through numerous jobs. Um, working on the front line was very tough for me. I worked in, in child protection, in um, foster care, um, working with refugees and accompanied minors and yeah, it took its toll on me. So after about four years, I um, was pretty much near burnout and had to take a step back mm -hmm. from from social work, yeah. 
I imagine there must have been a bit of a baptism of fire if you've grown up in leafy, comfortable, rather Of course, of mm-hmm. course. I mean, nothing prepared me, you know, mm-hmm. my wife and the child's background to um, work with with people who were coming from war torn Africa. I mean, it was it was traumatic, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was a, a maturing process, but also I think it also helped me to say, well, what do, I, what do I really want to do? What am I made for? You know, I cannot go and fix the world. I can't, you know, mm-hmm. save, save anyone. So it also, I think, set me on a deeper sort of journey of well, who am I purpose to be and to do. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, <laughs> Where did that take you? Yeah, I stepped back <laughs> from, from the front line and I went into more, um, I would say, administrative work and actually found that I have a gift of administration. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I went and did a bookkeeping course and then, you know, through, through various jobs I realised, no, but I still have a heart for social justice, so why don't I mix the two? And then I went, um, I was in Joburg at the time and, and started working at Child Eye and Karting in an administrative post mm-hmm. and worked up and, and ran finance and admin um, mm-hmm. department. But, you know, working with the social workers and with child protection, which is, is really on my heart, but doing it in a more sort of organisational support way. And that was a lovely match for me and I found out that's, that's me, you know. Wonderful. Yeah. And it sounds like, you know, your initial experience took quite a toll on you <clears throat> emotionally. Did that yes. take time to work through? I mean, yeah, I think it left me um, quite exposed and I actually suffered for years with chronic fatigue syndrome, which again is just a name for, I don't think doctors really know what it is, but mm. my experience of it was that I was quite tired and my immune system um, has been affected. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't work 100%, but, mm-hmm. um, yeah. There's ongoing effects Yeah, I mean, day. you know, different, different sort of levels, but uh, I would, yeah, say it's sure. still um, some, a factor. But, yeah, I think, you know, with any trial in life, um, again, I, I had to really sit and go, well, what what can I do to reduce my stress, for example? Okay, and then, and then you know, journey on, on working on my emotional wounding and, and healing and mm. yeah so and, and you said you went to the UK and worked there how long did you stay there only really? 18 months it didn't last long right. <laughs> uh, I didn't enjoy it to be honest I mean I love the fact that I could travel you know yeah. only parts you can then travel um, but you know I had no desire actually to to live and work there so were you in London I was for nine months and nine months in Essex okay yeah mm, cool mm. and Roy off, you know, studying accounting at uh, VITS, period in the military, but then feeling like business is the direction for you. So mm. what did that look like? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of what opened up for me in a sense. I got involved with four Jewish guys in Boxburg doing property management and property valuations and we developed properties and sold buildings and all sorts of things. Mm. And did well, learned a lot about, the most interesting time for me was learning about, the thing about that time was learning about the community of the Jews um, Mm -hmm. and getting to know and love the the values of of what I understood from the Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. So I grew to love that quite a lot and was included in their systems and their families and and that was really a special time for me. I was there for maybe 15, 20 years, something like that. Long time. Mm -hmm. And the business was quite successful as well. Yeah, yeah. I learned a lot about business, um, how to do all sorts of things. Some not so good, but <laughs> if you had to do them to learn, they're not so good. Yeah. Um, and yeah, but it was a good, successful on the business level experience. Very okay. good time. Yeah. And can I ask you both about you know faith backgrounds? Whether you know you, parallel to that journey was an expression of faith. Michelle, you you said you know God put this. You know, calling to social work on your hearts. I mean, were you brought up as part of a church? How did you get this sense of God calling you? Yes, no, I was um, (coughs) in a nominal Christian home, so we didn't attend church or anything, but my Omar lived next door, and she was a Christian. She went to St Andrews in Hildy Road in Newland. So when I was nine, I just said to her, can you take me to to, um, Sunday school? And yeah, I went and I didn't like it, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I had to wait until high school. Um, where I was much more exposed at Westford. I was very really Christian at that point. Um, went to the CU and 
had a friend in my hockey team who was a Christian. She invited me to youth church, mm. and then I started going to youth group. And yeah, I became a Christian um, when I was fifteen. I got confirmed in the Anglican Church. Okay. Yeah. And Roy, what about you? Yeah, also no, not even nominal background, um, that kind of thing. My dad said he went to Hilton College and he said, I've been to church enough for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. So he was totally absent. And my mom took us to be confirmed at a mm-hmm. Presbyterian church in Edinburgh, which is close to the Lifting Bench and Pierre Jarvis. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were confirmed, but it, was, it didn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just ticking a box and mm-hmm. just quite fun playing badminton on Friday nights or whatever the things right. were. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then when I went off to the army, um, something happened. I met, there was an advert in a newspaper, a double page thing from the Sunday Times. So I realized that it must have cost someone a lot of money to put it there. said, I'm the Christ. I've come and my time is here. And so I asked a, fr- a guy who'd become a friend, uh, what is this about as a Christian guy? Mm-hmm. And he told me about the Antichrist and all those theories, etc. So he said, positioned it for me. But something happened for me. That, in that moment, mm-hmm. something beyond my mind's ability to understand, I stopped swearing, boom, from typical army swearing to nothing. And to this day, swear words just don't come up, mm-hmm. uh, which is sometimes a bit frustrating, but still. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I knew there was something more in this that I could understand, that I could see. Um, and I hung around that him and his friends, and they were all Christian guys and pastors and um, senior quiet leaders in the vineyard movement of churches, mm-hmm. and would go to the meetings with them, but it was always just on the sidelines and quite enjoyed being with the guys who were the nice guys to be with. Mm-hmm. And then one night, there was a chap who came to preach, his name was Lonnie Frisbee, which in itself sounds a little bit weird. Um, and afterwards, we were just standing around chatting in a little group, Mm-hmm. And suddenly I just dropped onto the floor, I fell to the ground, jumped up straight away and pretended it didn't happen. And afterwards I said to my friend, what happened? He said, no, a lady came up behind you and prayed for you. And I thought, ooh, that's funny. And I left it, but I knew there was something more. Um, it was beyond, but my mind just, you know, you could go to that kind of place. Mm-hmm. And then started going to a, a charismatic church in Joburg, um, and a guy came to visit me one night. He said, can I pray for you? So he prays for me. I literally shot over a couch. Um, physically shot up in the air and across the area. You know, going back, I kind of think I must have been trying hard to get my attention on the deeper level. Um, so I was being very sensitive to that space. And to this day, I still can feel that strong presence of God, which is, which is often very comforting, very helpful. I mean, apart from... You know, a supernatural event of being catapulted over a couch. I mean, could you discern something more substantive or, you know, um, longer term changing in you? Yeah, so I think that began something for me in a sense. Initially, it didn't mean much at all, more than, you know, there's more of this than I've seen before. Mm-hmm. But as I journeyed on, and especially when I came down to Cape Town, I got involved in a church that would have been 96, 1996 or so. So it was a little. Canada and that whole laughing movement was 94 or something mm-hmm. that was now starting at this particular church. So during that time, I became more of a deeper thing. So I would in my own uh, Christian journey and my own thing be really questioning stuff and mm-hmm. trying to understand relationship failures and mm-hmm. uh, relationship troubles from the past and crying out to God to help me and heal me and mm-hmm. you know seeing patterns repeat and all of those kind of things. And, I'd go on a Sunday night to a church meeting and someone would, would like for, for a year, every Sunday night that I went, somebody would come up and they'd pray for me and they'd say, we feel God saying they'd answer the question that I'd been asking God the whole week. So there was a very real time to discuss it with anybody. So I started to realize, and then I took it a lot more seriously, I started to listen to God for myself. Um, and it began that, that inner journey, which started processes um, of, of healing, of getting into therapy and mm. doing the emotional work. Mm. Um, okay. So, Roy, I mean, you've touched on relationships, and I know that's <coughs> been a, a, a big part of your, your history that's been, been painful. You've you know, alluded, it goes back to the relationship with your dad or lack thereof. And mm. um, um, can you tell us a little bit about that, as much as you're comfortable, you know, what, what that journey was like for you? 
Yeah, I think in theory, looking for bonds and not looking for proper relationship peer to peer with with anybody. Um, in the overview, I was I've never pursued anybody. I was always pursued, mm-hmm. and I always just went with the flow. Mm-hmm. So I found myself in situations. <coughs> it was the right thing to do to get married, so you get married. They wanted to get married, so you get married. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after three months, this just isn't working out, and I'm unhappy, and I don't know what's going on. Having no parents or peers to mm-hmm. to discuss and to work it out, so the relationships shattered apart. Mm-hmm. Um, so that you know, twice I would say, so it would be four failed marriages. Um, two was probably my immaturity. Um, and walking away at the end of the day. The second two, which was, was Cape Town, um, you know, obviously I had my part to play, mm. but there were bad choices, and I made bad choices of people um, who allowed people to come in who after turns out money at the end mm. of the day, and it became significantly obvious to, to everybody mm. um, as, as time passed, and families became dependent, and... Mm. Um, it was just no relationship and all sorts of other stuff going down. Mm. So, yeah, that was the, the hard side of my life. Work side has been fairly consistent, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, coming to a point of saying, actually, uh, maybe I'm not meant for relationships and maybe I'm meant to be on my own, but I've never lived on my own. Mm. So that was the first challenge is to live on my own. So I lived on my own for five years um, and found a great deal of peace. Um, in that period, which was a surprise to me. But I went through it, it was obviously difficult in the beginning. Mm. Um, but I remember some Saturdays work during the week at work is fine. But then on a Saturday, I can remember waking up and filling up the kettle and making tea or coffee. And the next conscious thought was in the evening. Mm. You know, and then I'd been somewhere in the day, and then I became aware it was this inner world, this beautiful place of peace and comfort and gradually, little by little, and working with a therapist for 10 years, a Christian therapist, so it was so helpful in that sense, so she understood the spiritual journey and had actually journeyed quite significantly, both psychologically and spiritually for herself, so she was able to really help me. Um, so I found yeah, a lot of peace uh, on my own. Um, and children from those marriages? There are six children, mm-hmm. um, two, two, one, one. Mm-hmm. Um, Okay. Yeah. And are they still part of your life? They are, you know. Uh, one of them's living in Botswana and he's disowned me <laughs> because I stopped paying her varsity fee. Well, when she'd finished, I stopped paying her maintenance, so it'll be fine. But the other's fine. We're still involved with mm-hmm. the, older, the oldest two are Jodrick. Um, one's a psychologist, the other's a mom teaching um, stuff. The, the daughter's Kayla, and she's in Cape Town, she's a lawyer. Mm. Um, and then Josh, my son, he moved out to Joburg, who works at Standard Bank, also did accountancy. Mm. Um, and then we've got our youngest one who's still at school. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, yeah, mm. yeah we've, we together make a lot of effort to try and rebuild family. So mm. we've got all these different influences and different family systems and um, negotiating life with ex-partners and children uh, yeah. was not always straight <coughs> yeah so the kids are older so they're largely independent yeah but they having to learn to trust yeah because of course they were never welcome I would make them welcome but of course the people I was with would always reject yes what they happen to reject yeah um, and we've now got a totally different situation where it's safe to come home it's safe to open the fridge without asking whether mm-hmm. you can and little by little they trust and I mean we We've made that decision. They both feel called to work. So when I was on my own, I put a lot of time in with the kids um, mm-hmm. and worked through the pain of leaving them and mm-hmm. their pain. And we talked all that stuff through and found really close bonds. So when Michelle came, and I guess we'll talk about how that happened, yeah. um, they were quite suspicious. You know, we've seen you lose a lot of money before <laughs> um, in these divorces, um, which were yeah, significantly. Costly and starting again every time or sure. that time. Sure. Um, now here's somebody else coming to do that, so she had to put up with the suspicion and the stuff. But little by little, she's built a relationship with them. Yeah. Um, well, Michelle, I mean, did you have a relationship history before Roy, and uh, you know, how was 
How did you guys get together? Well, I, you know, I had no significant relationships, and I think um, one interesting I had also again on my heart just that marriage is very purposeful. So I'm always like, God, will you give me my husband? Type of thing, you know. Um, and then also just I suppose the years of in my late twenties, early thirties, when most people around me were setting down with partners or. Mm marriage partners, um, I wasn't that well, you know, so I was really just concentrating on myself. Um, and yeah, then did you ask when we met? Yeah. We met, we met while I was through, through my work actually, I was running a training program and Roy was on the board of one of the non-profits mm. that were attending the training, that was in 2012. Mm. Um, no massive sparks. <laughs> just, can you tell the story? Yeah, so it was a, a funny meeting because I had decided not to be in new relationships and to live on my own. Mm. So we sat in the first training session, which was on governance or something like that, and one of the my fellow trustees was with the two of us were there. So afterwards, at the first tea after the first session, Michelle was the she was running the training. She she had met this guy, Anton, who was with me, and she hadn't met me. So she came up and just introduced herself and was just asking all the right questions, the nice questions. And I'm not good at those questions, um, <laughs> playing those games. So she, she said, so, have you got any kids? <laughs> <laughs> just six. <laughs> you know, so I said, yeah, six kids, four ex-wives, and a jaw dropped. <laughs> And I was just trying to close down the conversation yeah. just um, too often and mm -hmm. get past it. But she looked back at me and she said, while God's preparing you for your wife, he's preparing your wife for you. So we kind of just ignored that, my friend and I, and we walked off and we put our coffee down and he said to me, that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> And so it was. Um, in my therapeutic journey, I was working with attractions at that stage and learning about mm. um, being attracted and what it means and how it works and how to interpret and work with that type of thing. So I noticed an attraction to the job and thought to myself, okay, that makes sense. Um, and that's, by that stage, I kind of realized if, you're, if I'm attracted to somebody, I pretty much know what kind of people they are. Mm. Um, and thought, okay, that's interesting. And I noted it. Um, I didn't have any serious thought about relationships with Michelle. She knew she was too young and I certainly wasn't in that stage. I had no idea um, who she was or anything. And so we, we left and that was it. No more contact or thoughts of each other or anything. We had another training session, probably a year later, maybe not so much on finance. Mm. And I went this time with one of the staff members from the trust. Mm. And we went through that, you were running that as well. And again, um, we would just have a little bit of interaction. Um, we we're sitting talking once in a group of people and um, I kind of drift off in those things. And she had apparently been saying to the group, I really like pinotage wine, etc." cetera. Um, so she caught me dozing, or, or not dozing, so I was just uh, distracted and asked me a question around that. Um, so I remember it quite well. Favourite one is Pinotage. <laughs> and that was, yeah, you know, we left it and that was it. Um, a few years later, um, I went to, so there was an old couple in our church who I'd done quite a lot of work with. We'd been travelling a bit, looking at um, opportunities for Christian retreats for them and for our church movement, etc. And then they'd gone, but I went quite well with them. Um, and then I heard that they'd come back and moved to Somerset West, mm. uh, which is quite far by Cape Town standards from Cape Town, so the suburbs. And um, I'd heard they were, and they were working for, or they were living with their daughter, mm. uh, and their daughter turned out to be Michelle's boss, working in this NGO environment. Um, so I went through a short, long story short, and had supper with them. And they were saying to me, you've been on your own too long now, and... Mm. Guys in our men's groups were saying, we're getting worried about you, um, you preferring boys, or all those kind of questions, laugh, laugh, etc. But uh, I had my purpose in my plan. And they said to me, she said to me, um, Priscilla, and I valued her view, she said, no, you, you, you write for relationships, you need a relationship. Who's, who stood out for you over the years? So I said to them, well, there was one person that kind of stood up, but she's way too young. And I said that just because I knew the link. Mm. Um, and I said, no, 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 Michelle. No, no, she's, she's not too young for you. She's not. 
Mm. Da, 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 da. So it kind of it did something for me in terms of um, that maybe she's not too young and what is too young anyway and sort of all those things. But I certainly was open to then a new relationship. Um, therapeutically also said you are a relationship person and the fact that you had difficulties caused by the wounding from the past um, and eventually thrown out of therapy in a sense of saying we can't do any more for you, we're going to live life now. Um, and that's supported by prophetic words around you know, like a panda bear, red panda bear, there's been a cage, everyone's been poking, but now God's opened the door mm. and you're going to live in the wild. So the two kind of parallel um, things for me. So I, I, I accepted that mm. and then started to think, well, who, who, God, you know, who have you got for me? Um, and it was a funny experience for, for like a month or so of falling in love with love mm. and having all the feels of first love, mm. feelings of first love, but without a person. <laughs> um, and then, so that was a little bit before I saw Jim and Priscilla. And then Jim and Priscilla, and then I thought, well, maybe it's Michelle, but no, it's, she's way too young for me. Mm. And I had a business meeting with a guy in a coffee shop and I got chatting to him about marriage and and all that is a stranger to that point. And he said to me, I've got a, a book that that you that sounds like you could really enjoy. It was um, Anne Gilbert, I think her name was. Elizabeth Gilbert. It was called Can Committed. Um, yeah. Skeptic makes peace with, with marriage. So he said, get it and read it. So I got it. And read it started off at the beginning and it said, it's the journey of this husband, and he was 17 years older than me, I was 17 years. <laughs> so I, I then asked Michelle's friend, who worked at our NGO, how old is Michelle? And it turned out to be the same as that. And I thought, hey, this is a little too coincidental. Mm. Um, so that was, Michelle was totally unaware um, of all of these things. And then I felt God show me some things about her, uh, about her character and stuff. And that was surprising to me because of my experience of God has been very respectful of people and their privacy and their boundaries. But then subsequently, Michelle had said, you know, Lord, please send my husband to me and tell him about me. I don't want to have to sell myself. <laughs> so that came out afterwards. And then I thought, <laughs> that was part of our checking, that this actually was something that was involved. So that made sense if you show me stuff up front. Men's work, we did men's work in our old church and I was preparing for a session and it was on the adventure of men taking risks and trusting God and taking going on an adventure with him. And I kept feeling fine Michelle and, and ask her out. Don't do that, Lord. It can't be out. And I've put it off for a long time. It just kept on coming up, kept on coming up. So eventually I took the, the safe route and I invited uh, two friends of mine who also knew Jimmy and Priscilla and Jimmy and Priscilla uh, for lunch. Mm. in Somerset West, and then I messaged, um, I, got, I got Michelle's email address and, mm -hmm. and sent her an email, would you like to join this group, we're catching up as old friends. So I thought it was safe for her, but actually safe for me. Mm. Um, and yeah, we went on our lunch, <laughs> um, which in itself was an interesting experience because um, Michelle arrived, she, she was clearly terrified <laughs> in her eyes with this, like, this absolute fear. <laughs> And yeah. um, uh, we had this, we carried on, we had a lovely time at lunch, all laughing and joking, and until we started whipping up pictures of grandchildren. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Michelle said, Are you a grandfather? And I thought, Yeah, you see, Lord, it's temperature dropped. Mm -hmm. And I thought, Well, sorry, and, you know, this isn't enough, I've misheard mm -hmm. uh, all of this. You anyway, know, so we, we chatted after the lunch, um, and she said to me, What is it that you wanted to talk about? I asked if we could talk after the lunch. And she said, I said, I said, look, I feel in God that there's something of a relationship for us. I don't know what it is, whether it's business or more than that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're interested to start off with being friendly and to see what happens, <laughs> um, she listened to that and then asked all the questions and all that type of thing. And uh, uh, we left. She said she'd, she'd come back to me. Um, that Sunday night, which was on a Saturday, the Sunday night she phoned me and she said, um, she just found us to chat. Um, she said, I've been thinking about your question. And, and we had a long, deep conversation and we realized that we were both in very similar places, having been through a lot of pain mm -hmm. and found the freedom from, with God in the, from that pain. So we could connect on a really deep level and then having a far more than a friend's discussion for a few hours on the phone. Um, 
And she then said to me, if we're going to have a relationship, it's, it's going to be more than just friendship. So I need to see God for this. Mm. So she took a week or so. She said, please don't find me, don't message me, don't pressure me. I don't do well with pressure. Mm. Correct me if I'm mm. saying anything wrong. Mm. Um, and so I learned to pray because now this was a passion in my heart. I uh, learned to trust. And then she found after a week, I've been up in Joburg for a while. I even said to my oldest daughter, I think there's actually somebody who's um, potentially mm. going to be good. And I just said that in faith to her. And she's the one who's coming the closest to mm. And came back from Joburg and um, Michelle found on a Sunday and said, sorry, I can't do this. So I grieved and mourned the end of the relationship, which wasn't really a relationship, but mm. cried it through and uh, carried on. Um, but kept feeling, a few days later, this feeling, I thought what happened is that I'd been to, I would go to pick and pay to buy groceries, etc., and pick up a lovely wine selection. Mm. And I had a wine thing with a couple of hundred bottle spaces and um, we were getting a bit empty. So I thought, well, I'm just going to start stocking up. Mm. Um, so I would go, I don't know much about wine, show me which ones to buy, because I've learned to try and follow uh, in, in everything that I do know. Mm. I do know. And I felt to grab a bottle of wine, it was a bottle of Pinotage, and it was, we're going back seven years or so, it was 300 grand, 299, and I thought, that's not a good wine to stick on the shelf and grow in value. <laughs> um, but I felt God say to me what I felt was God saying, take it to her, to her, to her with Michelle, and remember she likes Pinotage. Mm. So I laughed, and I thought, geez, I can make up stories, and mm. um, I bought the wine and uh, sat with it. And then one word that I just felt this message, tell Michelle about the Pinotop, tell her about the Pinotop. And I went off to gym and forgot about it. And came. I was just laughing at myself and just learning more about myself and the inner voices and all that kind of thing. And came back and got on return phone calls and then it just kept coming up again and again. And so I sent her a message saying, I don't know what you've done to me, but now well, I can choose this Pinotop. <laughs> Um, and maybe you can tell from the Okay, well, you know, from my side it was very overwhelming. And I say, I kind of felt really angry at God, like, what? This guy's been there, done that, and I haven't even started in terms of family and stuff. So it was very confusing to me. Um, and I think what I was kind of hoping for is like, open my Bible and go out with Roy, you know, but it didn't work like that. And so I had to say to him, I, I can't do this physically or mentally or psychologically, I just can't do this at the moment, I have to, you know, um, say no thanks. And, and I was very sad because I, I, had, I really, you know, thought he was an, an amazing person um, and I was very sad. But, you know, afterwards I thought, oh no, I, wouldn't, I was beginning to miss him and, mm. and I said to the Lord, but you know what, I can't phone him now and go, well, I said no, but now I'm saying yes and oh, so, you know, I'm trusting you. If it's meant to be, I know I can bump into him in a coffee shop or something, you know, so I'm mm. just trusting you on this. And so I was so excited when he then messaged me about the Pinotage, you know, because I was like waiting mm. for something to happen. And so I just love the way the Lord works. Mm. And that gave me an open to say, okay, let's, can we meet for coffee, you know? And then it was our process of getting to know each other. Um, and I think through that, you know, I got to know Roy and Roy, not Roy as a guy who's got, you know, six children and whatever. So, you know, I think this whole thing about people and baggage, I mean, we've all got baggage. It's really about who the person is. And so, uh, yeah, we ended up together, obviously. Here you are. Here we are. How long have you been? Six and a half years. Six and a half years. Six and a half years, yeah. And mm -hmm. we do have a a happy but a working relationship as well. Um, I think we both kind of saying it's not it's not per chance all of this. Uh, what has God mm -hmm. got for the relationship in itself, mm -hmm. apart from our own personal enjoyment of the relationship. Sure. And starting with our, with ourselves, so we realise that we offer each other the opportunity to to, to grow and to become more whole and to heal. Yeah. Um, so I know for me, mother wound was something I hadn't processed very much, and of course that comes out in the mouth in my relationship with our version of that, so that's been something for me to work through, and mm -hmm. sure with her father wound starting, and now I'm moving a little more into the mother wound space, <laughs> and so we, we work at those things, and we talk about them, and we, we seek God for healing from them, um, and new opportunity to 
to, to revisit some of those old pains. Um, sure. I think those things shatter relationships apart quite often because they're not understood, but somehow we both just understood mm. that this was the, the good path and the wrong path, and it actually didn't have much to do if I felt attacked and persecuted. It had not too much to do with me or even the Michelle that I loved, um, it was to do with her wounding and her past and vice versa. Um, so we somehow just have a very clear picture of that. And so we work with it and we find out our healing. And as we heal individually, obviously the depth of the relationship grows. And of course, that's very new space for me. I've never had a connected relationship, um, even with a mom. So it's, it's right, real new things and realizing it's never too late with God. Mm-hmm. We've got to trust and follow. And then moving that out into our children and yeah. trying to pull with them. Sure. Yeah. Wonderful story. And as part of that faith journey, you found yourself at IUC. Can you tell us a little bit about how, how that came to pass? So Michelle had been always in a church in some West charismatic church. I was in one here, and she moved to, to Cape Town, and she was living in some West, and decided to come to your church. Was my church, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I had roles there and we were doing quite a lot of work together as, as leadership and all that mm-hmm. kind of thing. So uh, she didn't have much and, and living cat wouldn't have been I suppose been crazy to drop all the way back out there. Mm-hmm. So we just decided to do that and both got involved. Um, I was involved and Charlotte involved in some uh, uh, leading some women's groups or women's group etc. But there was a leadership change in that church um, where a son took over from a father and with that brought new dynamics. So I wasn't very well with the son and that for a long time, but then um, it's not just short sure, circuit with a lot of dynamics, which values, the values of which didn't sit well with, um, with either of us. Um, mm-hmm. Even for me, it's quite generally quite laid back. Mm-hmm. So I started to confront those. Um, also in the NGO that, that I was involved with, it, um, uh, the CEO had an uh, emotional burnout breakdown. So Michelle came in to help on the day to day. They were mm-hmm. about 40 staff or something. So it's not a small organization. Mm-hmm. And I had to become far more operationally involved. And we realized there were a lot of gaps in the mm-hmm. operation. It always happens when someone goes on holiday or something, which is fine. Mm-hmm. But we realized that the structure of, of one strong leader and everybody just worshiping the leader, which functioned in that place and in the church. And so I said, it's got to be a team, and it's got to be a team of equals. Um, mm-hmm. So I started to really push hard, both in the church eldership space, of it's got to be a team of equals. You can't, this thing of lead elder, mm-hmm. you can have a leader if the person's gifted, but he's equal or she's equal mm-hmm. to, to the rest. And we had big principal differences on that. Um, and eventually, it just, we were kind of ejected, um, not actually asked yeah. to go, but we, we just started to get frozen out of relationships and mm. stuff. So I resigned as a trustee, Michelle, who carried this organization operation on the ground. Um, as this guy came back, so we didn't drop it, um, but we resigned from that. Stayed in the church, tried hard to work through the differences. Um, Michelle was also, mm-hmm. just to leave. Yeah, she also, also had um, some of the difficulties with other leaders in the church, except and it was just with one or two that we had to attach. The rest were all fine and involved, but you know, at the end of the day, we just felt that. So we looked around for church, um, visited the Catholic Church in Constantia. It was quite very, an experience. Yeah, very excluded. And nothing to do with the church, it's just a system. Yeah. Um, and we went in that system and didn't understand it, except mm-hmm. it was fine, the Anglican Church. Another charismatic church, etc., just drifted. And the young guy who is still a friend, um, was in England, he'd, he'd left the church for similar reasons some years before and come here. Mm. And uh, I've listened to Robert preach, uh, Breathing Underwater, Richard Raw stuff. Mm. Um, I listened through those series. So it wasn't strange to listen to strange thing. And I just uh, love the depth of, of Robert's um, talking and analysis and understanding. Mm. So Michelle said to me, what's the church that John had goes to? So I said, yeah, I already see. So we came and felt very happy and at peace and comfortable. <coughs> but carried on looking and just waited, just kept on feeling this is, this is the place to be. Mm-hmm. We felt led and called. And eventually we came for a little while and then decided to join. Mm-hmm. It was 2016 or something, 2017. Yeah. Yeah. 
Wonderful. Yeah. So what's what's next for you guys? Uh, are you both still working? And you know, uh, what's what's in your, your minds about you know where, where things are heading? Yeah, I work part time. I'm part time mom, mm-hmm. which of course a lot of people don't really think I am, but I am. Mm-hmm. Even though my kids aren't at my home, I'm yeah. still a mom. So yeah, I, I'm freelance part time for non profits. Mm-hmm. Um. And yeah, I have many hobbies. One, we are painting our house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we do it ourselves, so I'm also a part time painter. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, what's next? You know, who knows, actually? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Mm-hmm. Don't you know? Yeah, I think we have. We have learned. Yeah, so for me, it will be work for some time, for as long as possible. You know, okay. so I physically can. Are you still in the. Like, tell us about your, your work. No, I don't worry. Yeah, so I, I was always interested in the property management thing around RT. That was always a much more interesting space for me. So I eventually moved out of that into RT yeah. um, with a friend, that same friend that I was a Christian with. And we now mm-hmm. run this business together, Jailbird Boat's business with national clients, a couple of national clients. Right. Um, in the um, motorspace stuff, so the, the, one of the sort of front down big. Um, Motor space cars runs off our software in three or four hundred stores. Mm. And one of the bigger the biggest property managers in the country also runs off our software. So we, we support and develop and try and keep that up to date. We're converting from an old database into a new modern database. Mm. So that process is quite hectic. And we stretch between the two at the moment. So yeah. as long as I can and, and as my friend is similar age, so we realize we have less energy than we used to. But we've got a team that uh, looks like the trip. Grow up a younger team, so that will last. I'm pretty sure for a good few years to come. But you know, what's next for us? Our know, family, we just journey on. I think we've both learned that we don't have to worry too much about what's next because God's got that. And mm-hmm. as long as we follow, and I didn't know this, but Jesus didn't ever say worship me or love me. He said follow me, um, as I understand it. So we're trying to take that seriously and follow. And it often takes us into uncomfortable places, but then there's always a benefit for us as well yeah. uh, in that. So we, whatever those are, and whatever comes up, and um, fantastic, you don't know. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing so openly, both of you. You've taken us to some uncomfortable places, but also talked about how you've journeyed out of them and you know, found a sense of wholeness and, and, yeah. and hope. So it's been wonderful. So thank you so much for all the show. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>